Welcome everyone to the Crossover Lord Retrospective. I am Neil Purcell. I am the author of Decian, superhero webcomic, and I was also one of the many contributing artists and writers to the Crossover Lord. The team we have here with us is the group we had at the very end. Let's meet our roundtable. Here is the author of Mind Mistress, Flicker Flame, and the main writer behind Crossover Kill. What is your name, sir? It's Al Schroeder, and uh, I've been enjoying comics since way too long, since the, since the late 50s and early 60s. I'm easily the oldest one here. <laughs> and he is the artist of Indefensible Positions and Genocide Man. Tell us your name. Uh, it's Remus Shepard is my student then. Name I use everywhere on the net. Okie dokie. <laughs> and she is the author of The Green Avenger. What is your name? Uh, I'm Abby Lurkey. <laughs> but I go by Abby Lark nowadays. <laughs> and oh, I guess um, I uh, I I I have a story in Smut Peddler, and I'm now working as a translator for um, a, a site called jmanga.com. So I'm still working comics. The end. Excellent. And last but not least, he is the author of Point Guardian, Majestic Knight, and Hero Academy. What is your name, sir? My name is Ben Carver, and uh, you know uh, here I am. Rocky like a hurricane. <laughs> Excellent. And we're talking about the Crossover Lord tonight. Crossover Lord was the massive webcomic crossover featuring Mind Mistress, Decian, Dead Debbie, Mechagical Girl Lisa, A.N.T., Lightbringer, The Green Avenger, and Ultra from Point Guardian. What I have here is a series of questions, um, all mo most of which sub uh, submitted by Pablo Prano, our buddy from Animation Fish. <laughs> I'm just... I'm just going to go through these, and um, we're, uh, this is basically just to seed stories. If somebody answers a question in such a way that answers future questions, I'll skip them. Uh, so let's just get started from the top. Uh, what are your general influences in writing webcomic? Um, well, you know, I, I started out this is out. Um, Stanley, of course, was a big influence because I was around when Stanley started to actually write. X-Men, uh, Fantastic Four. I had a copy of X-Men number one and Spider-Man number one, and Fantastic Four number two. Um, mm -hmm. After that, uh, people like Neil Gaiman, uh, um, there are a lot of good comic artists, or comic writers, I meant to say. Um, of course, Crisis by Wolfman was a big influence on crossover lore. And so was the earlier Gardner Fox Crisis on Infinite Earth, I mean, Crisis on Earth 1 or 2, that became a recurring thing. Uh, and Gardner Fox was the first one, at, as far as I know, to do a cross-universe uh, crossover and sort of set out how much of comics view that after that. Okay. Shall we move on to Remus? Uh, if you like, I... I Looking for web comic uh, influences? Uh, I, just just any influence. It says general influences. I know, because most of my influences are from uh, professional comics, not not the ones on the web. Uh, you know, I go back to Claremont. It's, I was a big, big X-Men fan in my childhood. And I always wanted to do just comics. Uh, so there's some great web comics. I, I read them in that. But uh, I'm, I'm still trying to get the, uh, the four-color feel of the... Uh, the 16-page comic book. So. Okay. And we'll move on to Abby. So, oh, um, mm, well, my original influences for liking comics are probably most of Marvel stuff, um, like your Spider-Mans and your X-Men. But the um, the only thing that, the, the thing that really sort of set me on the path of, oh, hey, I can do comics too, it, uh, probably manga mostly and you know comics for Japanese comics that are sort of not geared not necessarily the ones that are all geared towards but the ones that are I don't know accepting of a feminine perspective because um you know it, it's clear even even if you're just even if you really enjoy them and even if you're a, a lady who loves comics of all stripes that most uh, especially when I was younger, most mainstream comics were geared towards dudes, and there weren't a lot of women involved. And seeing that, you know, there are places where where a person like me can go to do comics, um, that's what that's what really got me out of the past. Um, you know, 
and so uh i guess specifically i would have to say you know shoujo comics like magic knight rare and i was really into oh my goddess for a while um and nowadays as far as web comics goes i have a lot i have a really great um support sort of system around me of comic artists that i met through working on the green avenger and various other other things so i feel like they're a big inspiration to me in in all of the the comic projects that i do so like Anna Knox, who does um, a girl bot, um, and Spike Trotman, who does, um, among among other things, uh, <laughs> Templar, Arizona. And um, I'm also a good friend with Magnolia Porter, who's right now doing Monster Pulse, which is an excellent comic that everyone should read. Um, and so, you know, when I work on comics, it's because I have those around me. Oh, and my friend Terry, or I'm sorry, Lee Blower South and... Uh, and um, Lee and Lisa Blower South, do the comic God Seeker. They're really great, and I love all of my friends. Yeah. Okay, how about you, Ben? Well, I well, I started in comic books. I always loved comic books. Uh, it was uh, I was a DC boy. It's <laughs> that's just how I was. Uh, it was uh, it was mainly because uh, you know Batman the animated series got me into comic book characters I should say uh, it was mostly Bruce Tim and Paul Dini's work. Paul Dini, fantastic writer, um, and uh, also, it was around the t- you know when I first started doing a web comic, or before I should say, I was always fooling around with drawing, and uh, I, I I found a mentor. It was uh, a guy who used to ink Spider Man in the seventies for Marvel. He uh, he worked. Uh, he was he was actually a uh, one of Hollywood's apprentices. Uh, it was uh, Wayne Howard. Uh, he was uh, he he was like a second father to me. He really was. He uh, he taught me everything I needed to know about inking. He uh, and from and he learned from Wally Wood, who is arguably one of the best inkers ever in the industry. <laughs> I, I still feel half trained when I when I look at Wayne's work or Wally's work. It's like, oh boy, I still have a long way to go. And I'm I still ink with a brush when I do ink. And uh, Neil still tells me I need to move on to the 21st century, get a tablet. <laughs> and <laughs> Kitty Hawk says so too. Yes, that's true. And by the way, Abby, you would love Kitty Hawk. I think you both have similar manga tastes. Yeah, we probably do. No, I like her. I like her just fine. I still follow her her current her more current works. <laughs> okay, I just I just had to put that out there because I heard Ray Earth and these other things. I'm like, oh, that I mean, Kitty Hawk <laughs> get along just fine. But uh, like I said, my my influences are 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 basically the spirit of the older comics, but trying to keep the personality. Uh, you know, like I said, I try to look at the writings of say Chuck Dixon and uh, Marv Wolfman and. Uh, and Dan Jurgens and uh, Carl Kessel is one of my favorite writers as well. That's I know that's a very big mixed bag right there. <laughs> Not so much Dan Slott anymore. I think everyone else knows why. Yeah, well, yeah. I used to be a big fan too, but not so much. <laughs> okay, well there, there's my, there's my story. And I'm sticking to it. Okay, well I'm probably, <laughs> I'm gonna be the weird one here because I, I basically grew up on telev- televised cartoons and, um. I'm I'm more the 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 guy who grew up on the uh, the character actors and character writing. I, there's always a Chris Lotta character in in whatever I write. Um, <laughs> you could just you could just superimpose his voice on a certain character and it'll totally make sense. Um, later on, I I really got into Bill Watterson, Calvin and Hobbes, just because of uh, how he stood out on the comic page, the newspaper comic. Yeah. See. Very much. Right. Every everyone else had kind of the straight on perspective, but he would do like crane shots and he'd draw dinosaurs and and jet planes and all this all the stuff that I'd never and seen dinosaurs before. Dinosaurs in jet planes. Dinosaurs in jet planes. That's right. With pilot and, goggles. Yes. And <laughs> there's there's some influence in in that in what I do. Um, I I'll, I'll never pretend to be as good an artist as he does, but I always try to do like weird angles and and dramatic poses and all this stuff. And there are other people too. Of course, there's, there's Adam Warren and there's uh, Charlie Nazawa and uh, Mickey Moto, the guy who did the designs for Robotech. I love him. Mm-hmm. And yeah, but my early influences were always like TV uh, cartoons and um, Archie Neal. Ar- oh, of course, Archie. Oh my God. How could I forget Archie? There's a hilarious story I told a while ago about, uh, how my grandmother took me to a grocery store once and she just picked out some random Betty and Veronica double digest and said, here you go. And there's tons of beach scenes in this, these comics. <laughs> I was like, thanks, Graham. 
<laughs> so that that pretty much set me on my way. But yeah, um, I, I couldn't be an animator, so web comics came along, and I'm like, well, here's a medium I could use, and that's how I got started. Here we have we have one from Pablo. It says, uh, "Where did the crossover lord come from, and how did you guys get together?" And for this, to answer part of the question, I'm going to play a clip right here in the show. It's it's from our time on Webcomic Beacon episode 68. You'll hear Linkara tell part of the story, and then we'll come back and uh, we'll, we'll fill in some of the blanks. Who originally came up with the idea, and, and, and how did this how did the the idea for the the comic come about? Basically, Louis uh, th- Yep, that's me. Uh, Back when I was first starting out in the uh, webcomic business, I was, of course, both egotistical and ambitious, and I kind of went into it with the idea of, okay, I'll start my superhero, I'll get it started, but man, there are some really great other superhero webcomics out out there, and wouldn't it just be awesome if we could have a crossover between all of them, well, not really all of them, you know, as many as we can, can, Mm -hmm. just make a big event, kind of like the crossover wars that... uh, that uh, I've suddenly forgotten his name. Uh, that that started up about Act Two, except smaller scale, focusing more on superheroes. And right. once I was in for a couple months, I sent out an email to uh, several people who I definitely wanted on board, uh, including you know Neil and Al and Ida and Remus. Uh, actually, Remus uh, was not originally part of it, sorry. <laughs> but uh, I sent. But I also wanted to add in more. And so on the Comic Genesis forums, I made a call out for people to join in. Remus signed up, which was really great because I did read Indefensible Positions and it was awesome and had its own collection of superheroes. I actually didn't think that Debbie would be the one to join up. I thought it would be the uh, group's actual uh, quote-unquote traditional superhero whose name suddenly escapes me. It's been a while since I read it. Yeah. <laughs> he, he's uh, boring. Say again? <laughs> you're talking about Orbstar. Yeah. So, it, yeah he's, Orbstar. He's, he's a goody two-shoes. He's boring. I want someone with would be a little more interesting to interact with. You know, Orbstar and, and Lightbringer would just form a little clique and not let any of the girls play along. Of course. And I actually did, and Dead Debbie has made for some great uh, ideas that we have for some storylines we're going to have later on. Uh, but anyway, we first started this out, but then it became clear that all of us were pretty damn busy with our own stuff. And we were we had some reservations about the story. Uh, a lot of the story that, we, that you're seeing here is uh, pretty much the same as, as, uh, as it's originally conceived, but with some modifications throughout with a lot of plot details and whatnot. Uh, so, yeah, we basically sat on it for a while. and Especially you know, during the crossover wars. That, especially during that the crossover wars. That was going wars. on at the same time, and we figured that was too much to do that and the crossover wars at the same time. Mm. So, so, yeah, we basically... As Al said, we put, we uh, sat on that for a while and made sh- and you know didn't want to compete with Crossover Lord or confuse people who are already confused by the Crossover Wars. So uh, then we then about what a year ago, maybe maybe less than that, uh, we finally uh, started drawing a lot of the pages, and we're usually pretty well ahead of the game for each page that we put out. Sometimes there's gonna sometimes there's something that pops up that keeps us from doing so but yeah otherwise the system has worked out pretty well and that's how it started well what is the system well let's see now lewis did the original synopsis okay and then he and remus together did the first draft of a script uh at least for the first part of the story okay Mm -hmm. and since then um a lot of the times, either I or Neil, uh, usually me, but uh, Neil, uh, like, I'll do a thumbnail and, su- uh, and like a suggested dialogue, okay, of each page, and then everybody is free to take that and run with it any way they want to, okay? I do not believe in them keeping close to a particular script because a lot of them have root, each of them. Have their own streaks as creators, okay? Right. But 
that's how it's working right now until we change the system again. <laughs> but it's it's been a learning experience, and we found out, you know, Neil's best on the funny stuff. Uh, Remus is real good on the backgrounds. You know, uh, we found each of our strengths pretty much. Do you have a particular? Do you guys have a particular order as far as who gets to draw the next one, or do you kind of go? It's or? basically gauged on strength. Yeah, when we put out, we usually put out the you know the pages to be picked. You know, at like at least you know a month or two in advance, and we sort of. Someone makes a suggested. I think you know this one would be best handled by so and so. Is that okay with him? You know that sort of thing, and uh, we go on from there. You'll notice I'm not doing a lot of pages in that regard. <laughs> well, you're busy with college for one. Well, thing. I know, but really, I I really have to give props to the other wonderful team members here because. The fact that they have done so many pages is just incredible, especially with their own lives going on. And and Al, especially considering he also has two other web comics he's doing at the same time, uh, really, I do have to thank you guys so much for for all the hard work you put into this. This this wouldn't have worked out without you guys. Uh, especially Al and Neil, they've really been the workhorses here. I try and do what I can, but I'm very slow drawer, and and Neil can just bust something out so quickly. There's nothing else to give us an idea of what's coming up. I can't believe I'm being described as a workhorse. <laughs> I haven't updated my comic in months. <laughs> but you're, you're quick to p pitch in when needed, though. Yeah. So one of the things he left out was William Adams, the, uh, the author of Pillars of Faith, who did a lot of the early conceptual art. He designed Ringo, who was originally to be, to be named Bob, he he came up with the uh, with the the arena setting for Ringo. It was originally I think it was like a spaceship or something, and he came up with the symbol of Ringo, and he did he did a lot of creative stuff. And uh, yeah, the the basic design of Ringo, you know, the floating mask, the crazy looking wings to one side, you know, the you know that was all his. Okay, you know, he did that original conception, and we just were blown away. And the reason we didn't use Bob is that uh, at one point in uh, Countdown to Infinite Crisis, which was coming out around the same time, they had a cross-dimensional character called Bob, mm -hmm. just coincidentally. So we decided, well, we can't use Bob, so what do we use? And uh, I think it was Neil who suggested Ringo. I'm not sure, okay? I, I don't but, know. Yeah, I don't remember either. But well, uh, the the funny thing I, I was, is when I was looking at the initial artwork that Neil sent me, I, I saw this thing called Adam dot the Jason dot gif, and I opened it and I saw the Buffy villain Adam. And I'm like, w what's this? Yeah, the, there's kind of a story about that, and I'll I'll take the hit on this because we were we were pitching this as a webcomic crossover between original characters, and Pillars of Faith is a Buffy the Vampire Slayer fan comic. And I, I love William Adams, but I was I was like I can't really justify having our original characters running around with Eliza Dushku. <laughs> and <laughs> and the other thing is, would have, and I thought, felt kind of the same way as much as I loved his work, you know. But it was kind of like, you know, if this ever gets into copyright type, ter type territory, we're not gonna, we're leaving ourselves a big hit here. Otherwise. All these characters belong to us, but, you know, if we start to use a character from Buffy the Vampire Slayer, it's kind of... Mm. Yeah, that but was the it, other problem, yeah. Yeah, it's a, as much as I love Eliza Disco, I would love to run around with her, just not in a comic. Yeah, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind having a character that's derivative of her. I mean, I, one of my key characters is, uh, is basically an homage to... Uh, to uh, Jan Smithers from WKRP, so <laughs> I, I'm not above I'm not above uh, homaging my favorite actresses, but yeah, I was really afraid of uh, cease and desist letters, so I was like, we gotta we gotta put we gotta do something about this. Now, I joined in a little later, so this is kind of first I've heard of this. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I it's the first time I've heard of it. Yeah. Well, uh, he had a big hard drive crash after the initial, uh, you know. 
talking about it, so it sort of solved itself, okay? <laughs> but he always made a, you know, because he really did contribute a lot. At one point, we, we were thinking about designing these cards for different worlds and stuff, and he did some work on that, which we kind of, that seemed overcomplicated. But the but the original drawing of Ringo, you know, I yeah, just and, fell and in love with it, and Neil did, and all the people. Yeah. Um, I just feel like that would be really weird because of the fact that, um, I, it's, I don't know if everybody who's, who's, who's here or who's listening has read The Green Avenger, but it's actually a semi-autobiographical comic and therefore the main character is ostensibly me. And so, like, actually me running around with actually a lot of, that just sounds kind of like a little, it's a little much. <laughs> 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 like I said, as much as I love Elijah Dushku, just not here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Originally, when Kara did a thing on, uh, and it's probably, maybe you mentioned, but uh, on the Comic Genesis forums, you know, asking for people to, you know, contribute, and he originally thought it would run more than no more than thirty pages, otherwise people would get bored with it, you know. And I, uh, every time, uh, time I remember him saying that, I chuckle, you know, because because what the massive thing it became. But, yeah, uh, I he, think uh, Linkara did not realize what he was getting himself into because he was bringing in all these character writers, and Al and I, I think we were kind of thinking about something. I, I definitely was, and I was like, boy, yeah. wouldn't this be funny if these two characters, Desean and Mind Mistress, ever got together? Yeah, what I a, remember. What Neil a, would this be? I remember Neil always mentioned that it was almost like flirting with each other about it. Yeah. And yeah, I, I actually started this because I sent because for a while I was doing like sort of cheap uh, homage art comics that put a plug for Nine Mistress Two. So for fan art to other comics, I would show a meeting between my mistress and the character. And one of the first ones I did was with Neil. And I sort of look at Bastian and I looked at my mistress. I kind of went, there's absolutely no way they're going to get together. And then I thought, oh, that'd be really fun if they did. You know, so in their first, in that first thing I sent, it's basically the dialogue that we later used in Cross Overlord where, you know, uh, uh, my mistress says, you know, all you need is a cotton tail. And Hugh Hefner, who designed your outfit, Hugh Hefner, you just need a cotton tail on there. And she said, uh, you know, and Dacian said, who who designed your outfit? The, the Tin Man of All? <laughs> and it just went on from there, you know. I, I mean, I'm a big fan of uh, old pulp heroes, okay? And there's uh, some characters in the Doc Savage things, uh, Monk and Ham, who always did good sniping at each other. That They were half the fun of the, of the series, okay? And, of course, you know, there's Thing and... Uh, Johnny Storm and the early Fantastic Four, you know, would always be sniping at each other. And, well, you you always need that because if you have a bunch of people that always agree with each other in one room, it becomes very boring. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that actually reminds me of another, uh, you know, I wasn't part of it at the beginning. I was way too busy doing my insane uh, output. It's, uh, for people who don't know about Point Guardian, when I was updating it before I finished my five years, my five-year tenure of it, um, I did the most insane thing that anyone else has ever heard of in a web in the webcomic world. I drew five pages a day. I mean, five pages a week. I drew five pages a week, and I had a two-month buffer, and yeah. What's a buffer? It's the pages you have ahead of time, Neil. <laughs> People do that? I <laughs> Uh, they usually uh, start out start out with a little backload and then they use it up really quickly. I know I did. Yeah. Oh, well, I actually ended with my buffer still intact. I was one of those people that had this insane, insane you know, work ethic. That uh, I remember Neil once said, "Well, people have bad habits, Ben." <laughs> and, and like I said, it's uh, I was so busy drawing Point Guardian, I never really did anything with communities about it. It was like right when I was winding down, I was like, hey, can I join in? And, and everyone was like, sure. And and that's what happened. Actually, there's a funny story about an earlier crossover that uh, Ultra of Point Guardian was almost in. Uh, you remember that one comic with what's her name, Ultra Girl? Uh... She was the, the guest commentator in that wrestling match, Neil. Oh, oh uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, basically, the creator of that character sent me 
basically, it was a very professional, uh, like, 80-page uh, thick pamphlet of his idea of a crossover between his comic, the comic Stealth, the webcomic Stealth, and the uh, Point Guardian. It was very detailed, very well made, and then something fell apart. Mm. But I remember that because he sent me an actual paper pamphlet that had drawings and renderings, everything already set. It was it was very professional. I was super duper impressed. Okay. Um how how plotted in it in advance was the crossover lord? Um I'd say for the first year it was pretty well plotted in advance, but after that it kind of um not so much. <laughs> we, uh, well, we, the, we, we did a few side trips, but we knew yeah. where we were going. Right? Yeah. yeah. We, we had an overarching plot line that we wrote early, early on. That, that's true, but it's uh, some like like Neil was telling me certain things happened along the way. Like, um, you know, let me just say outright, there is no ill will towards Ida. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. She had the. Right. She ended up having to go on and do her own thing. Yeah. Uh-huh. Sure. Yeah, but, Which was a shame because the few pages she drew, that that was one of the cutest things I ever saw of either Dacian or my mistress. Oh, okay? yeah. Yeah, I got, her, I got, that stuff I got, is adorable. I got cavities. <laughs> <laughs> but, but even it was such a nice break from the other stuff, you know. I mean, it really was. And it's too bad she couldn't have contributed more. I know. Um, like, but like I said, there is no ill will in this group towards uh, Ida at all. Yeah, and, oh, no, uh, I, I'm glad we got to use her character. Her character is great. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah we had a lot of fun. Yeah, I'm glad right. she's doing. I'm glad she's doing stuff. You know. Absolutely. Yeah, I thought. I just thought it was funny that we had a bunch of uh, a bunch of men whose teen years were well behind them, and we were all trying to write this character. I I think I did mm-hmm. a pretty good job, <laughs> uh, or at least I hope I did. Um, I basically what I did was I went to my anime shelf and I got the. Uh, all, all, uh, I'm sorry. All-purpose cultural cat girl Nuku Nuku. Oh watched, God. watched a couple episodes. And I said, okay, wow. that's that's who Ant's going to be. Because I, I kind of had to do the character's <laughs> method style. I really hadn't, I really hadn't read Ant before. So I'm like, okay, uh, this IO character that's going to be Luna from Sailor Moon. And yeah. I, I had, a, I had another influence for for Pink Flash. I don't remember what it was, but um, later I, I went back and read it, and I it, the. The series is really clever. I love it, and I'm still yeah. in the middle of it. But but yeah, like I said, it just it's just really funny to me hearing that story because it's uh, because like I said, it's it, it is it is really cute, and uh, and love Ida's work and but yeah, there there are, actually is some things that changed over time. I mean, I, I remember well, there was a lot of discussion back and forth, you know, as mm-hmm. we went along, and we we brought up other plot points. You know, as we went along, you know, Remus was a very good prod on that. Well, it's uh, it's not at all like it's not at all like uh, let's say uh, you know J.K. Rowling was talking about Harry Potter and she said she had the last scene written before she finished the first book. It wasn't like that at all. No, <laughs> no, no. Because actually, like a lot of the stuff, the way that things ended up working out changed once I got along. You know, once I got to be involved. Um, I feel like there was a little bit of stuff that sort of that um, that you know the Green Avenger came along to to pick up certain aspects of the plot that other characters you know would not necessarily have treated the same way. Absolutely, yeah, and yeah. like especially like yeah, right right like at the very end. So when the Green Avenger came along, we had to write a, a fake heel turn in there, and then um, we had to have a we had a villain for you, didn't we? Huh? No, there was no green event. Well, because because the, I mean the the it was okay not to have a villain because um spoiler it's alert. Yeah, was your rival. Yeah, yeah, and also you know the whole thing where um where the the villain sort of had his his claws in the Green Avenger and was and was in some some sense um controlling her. Yeah, and uh, let, let's talk about the villain. The villain was the one, you know, when when crossover Lord was laid out, there was just basically certain things laid out. Like, okay, the villain is this guy called the Smiling Man, who who looks like Malcolm McDowell from A Clockwork Orange. Yeah. And <laughs> and, uh, and okay, where's powers? Oh, his powers are technology stuff, right? And uh, mm-hmm. yeah, and, he he kind of got fl- he got flushed out a bit for the crossover Lord. He originated in Lightbringer. And then mm-hmm. he became he became the crossover lord 
essentially. And um, there were there were design sketches for what the hero version of him was going to be. And I know one of the few design sketches that we got from Ida was of that. Mm-hmm. And I was very surprised to find that the other day. I, yes. I didn't think we had anything from Ida. Some of them look kind of creepy, but uh, I like the one with the big with the big have a nice day face, and yes. that leads to one of the biggest contributions I did when I did come along was I designed the the prison. Oh yes, <laughs> to be a giant mm-hmm. smiley face. <laughs> yes, you yeah. did. I did want to talk a bit more about what what story elements got changed because uh, originally what it was going to be is there's a there's a certain page in the crossover lord where. Lightbringer finds the the Omega Beam necklace or something, homing beam necklace, and this was supposed to be what would stop the Smiling Man because in Lightbringer he couldn't hit him with any energy beams at all, and it was supposed it was kind of like Mega Man finding the homing missiles and using it to to beat up Dive Man basically. That's what it reminds <laughs> me. Of. And and that never actually came to fruition. We had changed the story so much by the end that that part of the story is now a non sequitur. And what ended up happening is we have a much more cerebral ending where uh, Abby comes in and, uh, spoiler alert, Abby ends up saving the day entirely. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because, I'm awesome. Because <laughs> well, my, my favorite, I think my favorite panel in the whole thing, drawn by Corey Bellotti, is just the panel where she's got the book and she's like, you guys had this the whole time? And she turns to the smiling man and she goes, here you go. And throws the book, yeah, and it's out of context. Right Everyone's like, "Oh my god, you moron!" Uh, uh, out of context, it is but the most know, hilarious scene. Right now, that book, I, Lewis's original idea, I remember, was he wanted each of our heroes to find a special item at the armory, which would power us up, and he wanted to find that Omega necklace or whatever it was. But I think I'm the only one who actually did a page where my hero found something in the armory, and that was that book. Yeah, yeah. and it was. Boring. And when we when we when we threw away the idea of everyone finding a power-up in the armory, we scrambled for some idea of what was that book that Debbie found. <laughs> it wasn't until the end we figured out that it could be something useful. <laughs> <laughs> and and like I said, I actually like that because I remember when we were tossing around ideas towards the end. I remember because I was just reading some more um, Alan Moore around that time. I was just reading through my old Alan Moore collection. And I said, how about something like the Black Mercy? I think it was you, Remus, who said to me, there's there's between uh, punishment and justice. Mm-hmm. Was, was that you, Remus? Uh, it, might have been, it might have been Lewis. I'm sure. I, I'm pretty sure it was you. Well, okay. I'll take credit for it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to look this up now, but I think it was you. Well, we'll look it up after this. Okay. So. At any rate. So did we have anything else to say about uh, about the question? Well, I mean, there were some fun, fun diversions. I, I, I'm pretty proud of that uh, cemetery where there was all the other alternative versions of all the characters. Okay? Yeah, that was pretty that cool. That was a really spooky scene to me. And I thought that worked worked pretty well. It did. It did. I like, and the, I like how you tied that into Mind Mistress, because if anyone could have found other universes, other universe characters of herself, it would have been her. And this gave right. you a reason why that didn't happen. That's because at that point I was sick. And, and don't get me wrong, I like Alan Moore too, and I liked his Supremacy and Supreme and all this stuff. But, you know, and w- once you introduce parallel universe versions of yourself, uh, sooner or later it, it becomes. A cluster? Okay. Yeah, yeah. A cluster blank. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, I just like the idea of my mistress being the only one around and uh, like that around. And speaking of uh, alternate universe versions of each character, um, one of the things that I I tried to write in, or maybe it was me, uh, was that there there had to be like an explanation for why there were uh, um, alternate universe versions of characters that were fictional. For example, I think in Something Positive and Mind Mistress, they're fictional in each other's universe. There's there's examples mm-hmm. of uh, them appearing on posters and stuff. And it happens with the Green Avenger in uh, in in Ant. And I, I had worked that into... One of us worked it into, into the story somehow. And then there was the whole thing with uh, with the Brain Babe, which, I, which was uh, an idea I had, like, God, years before that. <laughs> and I, I just had to throw that in because that was just one of the most... One of the more uh, wonderful examples of 
to see and getting under my mistress's skin. I, I love doing pages. <laughs> yes, and if anything would have gotten under her her skin, that would have. <laughs> she, she cannot take that away. It's in her brain. She has photographic memory. Yeah, it's there forever. <laughs> yeah. You're talking about alternate universe characters. Is this a good time to mention Yari Boy? Oh, God, yes. Uh, deal, deal. Yeah. I, I love the Yai Boy story because it was just yesterday I saw Yai Boy sketches. I said to Neil, I never read Yai Boy. And I'm and like, there's no Yai Boy. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> I believe that was Remus's idea. Like, nobody took that and made it into a separate comic. Well, I think, that might, well. I think that might happen soon because I accidentally mentioned that in the, in Kitty Hawk's chat room and she's like, what, what, what's this? <laughs> <laughs> She'll do it. She will do it, yeah. Will she, she'd be the one of the best ones to do it, actually. Yes, she will. <laughs> yeah, I, I love the Yaoi Boy story because it's it's like, what if you guys had this twisted idea? Let's let's just have in the, the gathering scene this one hero called Yaoi Boy. <laughs> and I think that was it, Remus. That was me, and it was it was just a one line gag, and people ran with it. <laughs> oh God! And what what the character ended up being was this. Horribly dressed character with with the face of uh, of Zelos from Slayers. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, not Zelos. But as long as we're on on this topic, the next question is who came up with what exactly in the story? And um, like I said, Remus Remus came up with the Yowie Boy. I think I was the one who designed it because I can't imagine anyone else uh, would have drawn that. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that you did the design for that one. Yeah. Hey, Neil, were you the one who decided uh, who uh, picked Jenny everywhere as you know uh, working with Ringo? Yeah, that was that was one of those where I was uh, <clears throat> late on a page, and the the <laughs> the uh, the impetus behind that was well, Ringo is one color, Jenny everywhere is easy to draw, Red Robot is easy to draw. The, the setting is easy to draw. I'll just do a page like this. It'll take me like two or three hours. And that's what ended up happening. Right. It wasn't even part of the story. It was never scripted. And I just threw it in there. And I thought it was a great idea. It really was. <laughs> and it became part of the story. <laughs> the red robots returned. Yeah. it's uh, That was one of my pages, actually. It's <clears throat> But but like I said, it's, it's just really ha – I'm just really happy I got the chance to get in when I did. I got in around the halfway point, Neil? Um, Yeah. And I got Maybe to a do it. Past halfway. I got, Abby came in first, and then you came in. And I got to do a six-page side story with. Uh, and this is something I do in lots of pages, and this actually frustrates by other the other contributors greatly. I'd like to throw in a visual gag that everyone's not expecting, like oh. uh, I, like I had the villain attacks him, you know, starved for energy, being escorted by the smiling man into the center of his base, and and he's going to have a snack. Of the previous energy uh, absorber that was there, mm-hmm. who was purple, and I will not say who it was, in fear of copyright. <laughs> it, it like I like I said, I do that lot. Grimace. Life. What? It was well, you're grimace. not the uh, <laughs> we're not the first page again. that my mistress appears in uh, in the crossover lore. She's talking across universes and says, "Wait a minute, uh, hold, hold the line, Victor Reed." Lex one, Lex two, you know, and she's obviously talking about Reed Richards, Victor Von Doom, uh, Lex Luthor, you know, all, all these all these super minds, you know, from various comics. But yes. I didn't go any further again for copyright. Yeah, like I said, I, I it, it's Parasite, by the way, in case you're wondering, but I do gags like I that. So. I got they do gags like that in pages all the time. Like I uh, in the latest this crossover kill page I did, uh, I made Sharon look like Death from Bill and Ted because. I thought people would think that was funny. Well, he was about to and take my mistress on a bogus journey. Yes. Yes, he most certainly so, was. You suck my battleship. So uh, we we talked about what Lewis had had made. Basically, Lewis had uh, he'd come up with the outline of what the I'd say about the first four chapters were going to be four or five, and he like I said he came up with, came up with Bob who became Ringo and uh, the idea of the gathering which. Uh, became less a spaceship and more of a, a dimension unto itself. And he came up with the I gathering. Don't think, I don't think Lee Terra called him Bob in that line. Okay? Oh, really? I think he called him, you know, you know, sort of a generic guardian, and we went 
boy, that's dull, you know, let's let's do something more off the wall. And then we suggested Bob and then later had to switch it to Ringo. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And he, yeah, like Remus said, he came up with the, uh, with the armory. And uh, like we suggested, the armory was originally supposed to be, be for us to find these special weapons with which to fight the Smiling Man, which kind of happened uh, with the book, not, not, not so much with the, uh, with the homing beam, beam necklace and whatever the hell, whatever the hell else uh, our other characters were going to find. Um, I, I think I think what fell apart there was that I I really wasn't interested in enhancing Desean's powers because I had already done that at the beginning with the story. costume. Yeah, with the costume change because I got I got tired of her not fly, being able to fly. It's like oh she's grounded all the time. Um, okay, for this story she's going to fly, and yeah. for for her to go to this armory and get a new weapon, I'm like I can't imagine what that would be. She can. She can basically punch a tank and destroy it. So what what is she gonna find? And Mind Mistress has all sorts of cool powers that are, I can't imagine what you'd attack onto her. So I was like, uh, I don't really know what to do. So we just started writing like silly scenes, like the breakfast scene and the uh, <laughs> yeah, anything with the eating. For some reason, I had this idea that eating was funny. <laughs> right. No eating, no. Yeah, because uh, I, I just remember uh, scenes in in, uh, in in sitcoms like All in the Family where they'd be sitting around eating, and it would just be them like chowing down on food, and for some reason it would be hilarious. <laughs> and like, uh, seen Archie Bunker eat? Yeah. <laughs> and one nice thing about having all the creators, because that's a little, you know, what we were doing was a little different from the average teen book from Marvel or DC, okay? I mean, usually there you usually have one writer who's assigned to it, and he gets to do whatever he wants with the character. He might consult the original writers, but he might not. But here you had all the original owners of the characters, except, you know, when Ida dropped out, but, you know, for the most part, okay? You know, making comments and saying, no, that's not what he would say, or that's not how he'd react. So you got a good delineation of characters, okay? Mm -hmm. I mean, Lightbringer... They the uh, tight ass, <laughs> uh, the good petty coat. It drove everybody crazy, you know. And you know, my mistress stayed the cold, and, you know, little snarky, you know, person that she is, and uh, you know, I, I mean, it, it made for some, some really good interaction because all the original owners of the characters had direct input. You know, it's like if in Justice League, Jerry Siegel was contributing to Superman's uh, writing and uh, Bill Finger was contributing to uh, uh, Batman's dialogue, you know, and all this stuff, in, in, instead of Gardner Fox just writing it all. And like I said, it, it, well, actually not like I said, I should stop using that as a segue. <laughs> That's a bad habit. Uh, an interesting a jar for when you say that. Okay. Anyways, um, I remember when we brought Ultra in, there was actually some talk of, do we really need another square-jawed hero? Mm -hmm. Because that's what Ultra is. Yeah. But but actually, the thing is, um, it's not really explored that well because Ultra is already captured when we when we're introduced to him, and uh, <clears throat> Ultra. I never saw him as completely square jaw. I see him inspired by comic books. I see him as the kind of guy who he, who basically he he works hard, he tries hard, but uh, he uh, he's a regular guy. He he works as a private investigator. He used to be a cop, so he's seen the underbelly. He's seen all that shit. He's uh oh, I, I, but you know I I see the fact that he can have a family. He hangs out with. He 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 disagrees with other heroes, but he still works with them. As, as as a sign that he he's a guy who, you know, he's not a tight ass. He doesn't go around judging the other heroes around him. I should say, he he. I don't know the best way of saying this, Neil. Uh, I don't know. It's your character. Um. <laughs> uh. Well, since you're asking me, and since the next question is, how did you handle writing each other's characters? Um. To be honest, I didn't write Ultra that much, so I didn't really have. I don't really. I can't really answer the question as far as Ultra goes. Well, Al, uh, Al, Al has read all the point guard. I think Al knows what I'm trying to say with, without trying to. Yeah, well, up. he's a little he's a little less uh, Dudley Do Right than Lightbringer was. Okay, 
okay. And, and you know, Link Hera very deliberately wrote him that way. That's not putting down Link Hera. That's the character he wanted to do. You know, a very idealistic, Superman-ish, you know, uh, type character. You're right, Point Guardian, well, one thing, Point Guardian worked with a bunch of other heroes, okay? Uh, Link Hera made it very clear that um, uh, Lightbringer was the first superhero in his world. So he never had to work with anybody else, you know, except toward the end of his run after Crossover Kill. I mean, there was another character introduced who worked with Lightbringer who sort of had superpowers. But, uh, you know, it, it was, it, it, but they were similar. We didn't have a lot of scenes with Ultra and Lightbringer uh, doing a lot together because there are a lot of similarities, okay? Yeah, there's difference between him and Lightbringer. But sort of the the idealistic to the point of being a pain in the neck slot was already filled with Lightbringer. Okay. Yeah, so, I never really saw Ultra as idealistic to the point of being a pain in the neck. He's he's optimistic, but he doesn't he he um I, I think he main, practices but doesn't preach. He practices but he practices but he doesn't preach. That that's the best mm -hmm. way I can put it. I, I think the main difference story wise between Ultra and Lightbringer is that for Lightbringer, this was personal. Your Spider-Man came after him in his dimension. And I think that you know, there was a, a more emotional thing there for Lightbringer, whereas for Ultra, this was a job. It was a very important job, but it was a job mm -hmm. he was going to get done. Right. Yeah. And like I said, I, I see him as a guy who was a cop, who who has worked in the line of duty when li where lives are on the line. So he he's, he's already technically hardened before, even before he was a superhero. That, that's how I always wrote Ultra. He's, he's a guy who... Yeah, he he's seen how bad things can get, and and that's how I always wrote him. It's a, uh, and it, it actually now that I think of it, I actually I actually would have wanted a scene with just Ultra and Lightbringer together because it would have been able to draw more. It would have been able to show the more stark differences when there's some similar when there's some baseline similarities. Very much how uh, there was there was a book a couple years back where they had uh, they had Mister uh, Majestic with Superman. Uh -huh. And I guess none of you uh, read. Nope, okay. not familiar. <laughs> oh. I okay, well, Wildstorm character uh, from the Wildcats universe that was very Supermanish. Yeah. Uh, yes, I, I know. It's, it's about as close as Supreme was to Superman. Let's put it that way. Yeah, that's that's a very fair uh, assessment. But like I said, I now that I think of it, I probably would have wanted a scene like that just to show the differences. Because I think that would have actually made it a little bit more powerful. But, you know, that's every time I do any kind of story, you know, I'm number one, I'm immensely proud of all you guys and all the work we've done together. But, you know, this this is not this is not any slight on you guys, but anytime I do anything, I always look back and say, hmm, could have done this differently. And I imagine you all are the same. Oh, yeah. I think one character that I enjoyed a lot that I didn't think I would was uh, Remus's Dead Debbie. What was that you were breaking up? I'm sorry. You're getting easy. She only got one emotion. Starfleet, we need more signal. Oh, uh, well, I'll I'll jump in here because I Dead Dead W was the one I was the least sure about too, but I kind of thought of her as a as maybe like a grandmother figure, but you know a little more peppy, but. You know, so, someone who likes to tell stories and answers every, every or ends every sentence with dear and a really creepy grandmother. That that's what it was the factor to me. She was, she was creepy in a sort of smiling. She was a do gooder, but she was a creepy creepy do gooder, and she really uh, was a good contrast for Aunt, yeah. who was you know bright and sunshiny, you know, and enthusiastic to the point of ridiculousness. And then you had Deb Debbie, who was dead. And, you know. But otherwise, a very yeah, pleasant yeah. personality. Yeah. yeah. Debbie and Ed were great foils for each other. But in general, I, I think I can get a good community character to write it for. Because she only has one emotion. She just pleads with herself all the time. That's right. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I think I had to remind people not to talk sounding, which I think in the early days they tended to do. Okay, Neil, the next question. <laughs> okay. Um. Well... Well, hang on. We, we were, I was just 
we were just getting into how we were writing each other's characters. And I, oh. I had already talked about how I wrote Lisa. Uh, with Mind Mistress, uh, I would just I would just imagine her as a very very calm and uh, a very calm person who would think everything out, but had just a little slight biting sense of humor. Nothing nothing malicious, but she'd always kind of get her digs in on Desian, especially you know Desian would would return with uh, with digs of her own, but it uh, just pitting the two of them to, together uh, against each other and then building up this love hate relationship. I really loved writing for Mind Mistress, and I, I did try to emulate Al's Al's writing to some degree, and he would he would correct me a lot, but I I love I love writing that character. Well, you, you did the same with me and Dawson. So. Yeah, but, yeah, it's uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Abby was Abby was pretty easy because I, I I was like, well, Abby's Abby, and I think mm-hmm. there literally was something from one of her emails where she responded to something I'd put into into the script, and I'm like, well, I'll just put that in the script. I think uh, Justine called her crabby and. I forget what the response was, but I put it right into the comic. Like I don't get that already, or something like that. Yeah, probably, probably something like that. Because when I was looking at the, when I was like looking at some of the like clips that were in the um, preparatory materials for this discussion, I was like, oh yeah, <laughs> Dotson called called Abby crabby, and I'm just like, it's just something that you hear a lot when you are an Abby who is not. Chip, chip burn for the all the time. <laughs> yeah, the only other character I wrote that wasn't mine was when I wrote uh, Ring, Ringo, and mm-hmm. uh, basically I wrote the scene where uh, where uh, I wrote the scene where Ataxim is chasing Ultra through this uh, through Ringo's dimension, and I actually had Ultra throw at uh, Ataxim one of the platforms because I thought you know there's all these floating platforms here. What happened if someone threw one? So you know that's what I do, and uh, <laughs> I had him throw it. And then I had I drew Ringo, and uh, I remember lots of people were confused because I didn't draw a full Ringo. I just drew the head and the hands. Mm-hmm. I was like, yeah, I'm just gonna draw the. Full. And that's the that's the only bit of dialogue that I wrote of someone else's character was when I wrote Ringo saying, "I need your help." Yeah, Ringo mm-hmm. was kind of a character by committee. Uh, I just wrote him as kind of this doddering old fool who would be forgetful and and scratch his chin a lot and have some idea what his job was, but not really very good at it. Ah. Just kind of an old dude. <laughs> yeah, really. I always thought of him as like Merlin and Sword of the Stone. Okay. Sure, you know, yeah. That sort of, yeah. Sort of, you know, I mean, lot, lot, lots of knowledge, lots of power, but, you know, you know, he, he's going to mess up. Which, again, made him a nice uh, relief from, say, oh, The Watcher or uh, mm-hmm. any other cosmic near omnipotent know it all and besides we already had mind mistress you know to be sort of a, a, a know it all about mm-hmm. something you know let, let's do it a little differently on uh, and you know it actually worked kind of well with the story yeah i'm looking back at this fight you were talking about neil and i had to bring it up okay pocket sand oh yeah there was there was a huge fight with uh the and green avenger and i that don't remember who pitched crazy. it i think it might have been abby who pitched it and i was like yeah yeah, let's do this. Let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> let's go. And um, there was a lot of stuff drawn, and a lot of it didn't get used. The pocket sand didn't get used just because Desian doesn't have pockets. <laughs> and, and it's one where uh, she throws sand in in uh, Abby's face. Well, first it was going to be Lightbringer's uh, cuff because he he shoots light, but it turned out that that's his actual power. The cuffs don't mean anything. So I changed it to sand, and later just it just never made it into the comic. And there were there were a couple scenes in that fight that didn't make it in. And I, Ben's Ben's got the got the sketches, so you'll be seeing those during the show, during the YouTube version of the show, anyway. Yeah, I I just, I just love the the pocket sand because I I actually asked Neil if you knew about that King of the Hill episode, would you have actually had Doss shout pocket sand? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, speaking of interacting with each other's characters, I love the way that Dacian reacted totally different to Lorelai than she did to Mind Mistress. Yeah, that was nice. That was well, some good writing there. Yeah. And that was that was part of the build up to the scene of the uh in the prison where Puppy Dog Eyes. Yeah, the puppy dog eyes scene. There's yeah. a there's a scene in yeah. the in the scene with Lorelai where she's Lorelai where she's She's moving her hair behind her ear because that's how she's always drawn. And then I reprise that in the prison scene. 
and that was kind of my aren't I clever type thing. I don't know if anyone really thought that was clever, but I, I thought that was, that was pretty touching. And the that scene is one of the one of the favorites. A lot of people told me. And uh, you're looking back at the, the interaction between Dossie and, and Mind Masters, I think that really is the bread and butter. Uh, at, at least that's the stuff that I love the most about, and especially the way that the, you, you drew that filler image when Al had the flu. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I'm looking at it closer, and I just realized Dossian is reading The Great Gatsby. Yes. <laughs> no wonder no wonder my mistress looks like she's in hell. <laughs> I didn't know. I had no idea that that Doss was cough manning him, cough manning her. <laughs> oh my God, that's horrible, Neil. Oh God. <laughs> so, no, I lost my train of thought. I had. And I killed. I killed the room. I had something in mind. I don't remember what I was going to say now. But, um. Oh yeah, I was. I'll admit, I'm. I'm a bit of a ham and. This this comic that got started by by Linkara basically got as as uh, Al had said hijacked. Um, we've said in in the email re- correspondence, and I and I re- retorted back to him. I'm like, we so did. <laughs> well, <laughs> because this this 30 page comic that was originally supposed to pl- take place turned out to be, I don't know, well over 100 pages by the end. <laughs> Yeah. One thing that's interesting to me is I was reading some of the comments you had on some of the pages, Neil. You were talking about writing other people's characters, and the page where you had that, the I think it was a page drawn by Remus, but it, the it was the art by Remus, but it was uh, written by you and Al, maybe Remus as well. Where your note, Neil, was was about how uh, Lightbringer was a pacifist, and, and it turns out we found later that's not true. Yeah, it, I had not read Lightbringer until much later, and I was like, "Oh, oh, his parents were the pacifists," and yeah. he, yeah, and that that kind of changed my perspective on Lightbringer after a while. Because <laughs> I'll admit, there was a scene where, assuming that Lightbringer was the, was the pacifist, I thought that the argument between Mind Mistress and Lightbringer made her sort of lose the argument. But after realize that after realizing what like what uh, Lewis's intent actually was, I'm like. No, actually, that does work, and I stopped. Mm-hmm. I stopped meddling with the scene because I didn't know what I was talking about. Yeah, it's, 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 it's like I said, it was just funny reading that. I was like, you know, because what kind of pacifist runs around beating up criminals in the middle of the night? <laughs> I I don't know. <laughs> the, uh, the old Steve Ditko Hawk and Dove, you know, the, which is why it doesn't ever work in that. <laughs> Well, it depends on who you ask, which comic historian, because lots of people think that uh, Ditko wrote Dove to be ineffective, and lots of other historians say that afterwards uh, Hawk was just a hothead that was stupid. So it depends on which historian you ask who got Hawk and Dove right, and that's another that's another show. <laughs> As Alton Brown would say, but that's another show. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, but it really wasn't that hard to write a, a, the other characters now. I must admit, I tried hard to read as much as I could of the other characters before they uh, before they came on to try to acquaint myself. But you know, I still get constantly corrected. But as far as running away with the script, you know, me and Neil did it partly because we we started to really love the the Dacian my mistress interaction, and really the story was such that if we'd done it as a thirty page story. It would have been real, you know, it would have been like, uh, I don't know, one of those spinoffs from Infinity Gauntlet where they destroy the universe in one one uh, issue and then come back. You know, they, it really needs a lot more room, especially for the character interaction. But, yeah, me and Neil were one of the main instigators because we just like the interaction between the characters. And Absolutely. As I said, I am – I. I, I am a ham, and even in even in Heroes Unite, they brought in Desean for a couple of pages, and I I asked to see the script. I was like, can I do some rewrites on her on her dialogue? Because I'm like, I have all these funny one-liners that I want to put in there, and they actually credited me as one of the writers for rewriting all the all the Desean lines. I'm like, you I, you didn't have to do that. <laughs> I, I didn't think I contributed that much. All I did was switch like maybe four or five lines. 
Yeah, but, Neil is the fan of the 80s cartoon one-liners, how Neil always put uh, it. Yeah. It's a, yep. it, it, I mean, Neil is inspired by the school of thought of Buzz Dixon. Yeah, Buzz Dixon, Flint Dilly. I, I loved uh, Shipwreck from G.I. Joe. What was that? I said, they got credit you if you punch up the script. I, I guess. One of the things I also liked about it is that in some ways, uh, crossover Lord was kind of like the old All Star comics, okay? In the old All Star comics, you'd have different chapters drawn by the original artist, where they, like you know the Hawkman chapter would be drawn by the current Hawkman artist, okay? There'd be a beginning, and you know you'd have you know these chapters in between, and then at the end they'd all get back together. Well, it was kind of like that in Crossover Lord, except that every page you weren't sure who was not, if you were the leader, you weren't sure who would take over the art file okay, mm-hmm. the next time. And sometimes we weren't either, you know, it depended on who had enough time to do it, okay? Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, in a way, it actually made it more fun because you got to see a lot of different people's takes on the character. Absolutely. And uh, to speak of another contributor that we love, it's. Uh... You know, every time Dan threw up a page in Crossover Lawyer, I was like, oh, oh, my God. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Dan was amazing. And, in fact, Dan did uh, did a spinoff of his own where the, the characters from Crossover Lord did battle with Super Dan. And that was hilarious. Yeah, but yes, not, so, not so much uh, Dan rehashing the old uh, feminist costume argument with Dossie and uh, he I don't remember him doing that. But what he did was he... He took the cat girl co- costume from the April Fool's Day strip that I did, where it was them in a sprite comic, and I just I just didn't think any of it, anything of it because it was like a parody of like the Tanuki suit from Super Mario Three, and then he brought that into his comic and kept using it. I'm like, oh, just everything he did just lined up perfectly. If you read if you read Bad Guy High Adventures and then go back and read Cross Overlord, he he did so many connecting points like. There was there was a scene where Super Dan actually shows up in a flashback in Cross Overlord, and he uses mm-hmm. the exact same dialogue in his version. And he he got a, a couple other connection points that re- worked really well. I can't remember what, what they all were, but it was it was brilliant. So that wasn't actually released the picture of of Super Dan and Dossie in switching costumes. Oh, that oh you're talking about that that was yeah that, that was, was just him being cheeky. That 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 that's burned in my retinas. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, you will remember yeah. it forever. <laughs> Oh God! So, uh, it, it, it's Super Dan wearing the Dacian costume. It's oh my God! And Dacian's wearing Super Dan's costume, and she looks pretty good in it. Yeah, but that doesn't, especially the fact that Super Dan's turned like three fourths back. You know oh, what? God, you you've been talking to to Kitty Hawk all this time, and you're not used to that by now. No. Yeah, you know, I I just don't even think about it anymore. I I I know so many girls who are into Yaoi. I'm like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> I've seen naked men. I try not to. <laughs> like I, I draw to see, and so I'm not gonna have a double standard. Go ahead, do that. I don't, I don't mind. Oh yeah, it's a, it burns in my retinas. Okay, go on. <laughs> well, well, let's see. The last question. Well, we kind of answered this. It was how. Well, I'll pitch it anyway. How was the crossover lord influenced by big mean, mainstream event comics at the time, if at all? Um, from my end, uh, not not at all, really, because I don't really read comics. Well, because uh, we did change did. the name from Bob to Ringo, because again, there was, yeah, that's true. But yeah, uh, no. I mean, it was influenced by a lot of previous crossovers, but uh, other than trying not trying to stay away from what was being done at the time. Uh, Remus, uh, I think Remus is trying to say something. Yeah. Well, yeah, I don't know if you can hear me. The original name for the entire crossover was Crossover on Infinite Web Comics, or Crisis on Infinite Web Comics. So we were originally pulling off of that DC uh, crossover. In, the, in fact, there's a cover, Neil. There is. Um, uh, the uh, Put Me Down, I'm Okay. Oh, oh right. That was that was much later. That was, yeah, that was a, a lampoon on the whole crisis. That was a gag. That was fun to do. I got... I emailed so many people, and there was only two people I didn't get permission from. One was uh, Short Pack. I, there was a superhero in Short Pack that got recommended to me, and, and he just never uh, – David Willis never got back to me. And then the other one that is going to, like, perk eyebrows because no, no one's going to know what this is is 
the band Racer X had a <laughs> had an album called uh, Superheroes, and on the back cover it's them dressed as these ridiculous superheroes, and I wanted to throw them in there, and I got their agent, but they never got back to me, so I never got to use that. Yeah, and the, as for, but as I got for, empowered. But but as for David Willis, you know, everyone knows my feelings about David Willis, so let's move on. <laughs> Yeah, but as I'm I, remembering, and you may want to put this back toward the beginning um, when we're talking about the origins, actually when Tara did the proposal about a year before we actually started working on it, you know, like he had sort of the general idea, and I think all of us were a little busy at the time, and then we sort of, oh, I, I, I know what it was. R- right then they were having that um, the crossover war. Yes, it was. Uh, it was yeah. I, I remember that. That was run by uh, Hogan, or am I thinking something yeah. else? Uh, yeah, and they they were doing this. And, and my mistress got involved in this too. And I, I was able toward the end to do sort of hints of what was coming up. I think the first time Smiling Man appeared outside of uh, uh, Lightbringer. Uh, um, Lightbringer was when I had him sort of show up at the end of uh, sort of an epilogue of the crossover wars that showed up in my mistress. And then I had him look at Dacian. You know, there, there were several people they sort of looked at at the very end. And that was sort of the hint, first hint of what, what was to come. Uh, maybe, uh, may, maybe I should send that page to Ben or uh, Neil or, yeah, at least a link to it so they can see it. Okay. That sort of. But we held it off because we figured doing that at the same time as the crossover wars were running, you know, people would be so sick of crossovers, you know, that it'd just uh, kill it. But afterwards, we did that. And uh, I was also recalling at the time, this is just for me personally, okay? Um, I'm like a lot of you, like I read comics and think of different variations and spins of the characters and... Uh, various crossover, and before Crisis happened, back when DC had several different Earths, like Earth-1, Earth-2, mm-hmm. Earth-S, where the Shazam heroes were, and Earth-X, where the Freedom Fighters were, okay, and where the Nazis won World War II. I was trying to think of a way to sort of have them work together in, in a regular con and I came up with the idea of this comic called Crisis Core, which would have one character from Earth-1, like, say, the Barry Allen Flash, one character from Earth 2, and I always alternated between Power Girl for obvious reasons and Dr. Fate, <laughs> and uh, Captain Marvel Jr. from Earth S, and someone like the Ray or Phantom Lady from uh, Freedom Fighters, and have them all from diff, you know, as sort of representatives of their different Earth. And I didn't think about it when Link Era first suggested that, but when we started to work on it in earnest, I kind of went to myself, you know, hey, this is actually. You know, if I play this right, I could sort of do some of the stuff that I was sort of thinking of for Crisis Core, which, you know, I mean, it was it was like a lot of pipe dreams that we have over the years, and I just only half remembered it. But it was one of the germs, at least for me, when I did my part of the plotting, you know, I was kind of thinking, you know, treating it the same way. You know, you have one hero from each one of these different Earths, and that's really the only way... Yeah, I know Heroes Unite try, uh, tries to do it, and they're all in the same reality. But for most web comic creators, they're creating their own comic, and they're trying to do it mostly in their own world, okay? So the only way you'd get a big comic crossover is if it was a cross-dimensional thing. So it sort mm-hmm. of flow together. So what I think what we'll do now is... Uh... We'll take an intermission. What what we're going to do is we're going to come back, but we're going to play a couple audio clips. The first one is going to be uh, the ad bumper that got run on Drunk Duck News uh, during the gig cast. Uh, J.T. Shea got me this clip, and it's Black Kitty and Spang uh, advertising comic from uh, April 18th, I think. And after that, we're going to play a short clip that was a really funny clip from the same episode of Webcomic Beacon, uh, where... uh, Al gets it's Valkyrie Yuki's name wrong, and hilarity ensues. And then we'll come back and uh, take some questions from uh, actual readers and not just Pablo. But it's still <laughs> going to be mostly Pablo. We love Pablo. Yes. It's time for intermission, boys and girls. 
Like animation? Come listen to Animation Aficionados. And if you disagree with us, you could be a guest on a future show. Available on iTunes, the Zune Market, and AnimationAficionados.com. The Webcast Beacon Network has been covering and promoting creativity and the creative process since 2007, starting with the Web Comic Beacon, a topical web comics podcast with a jovial bunch of misfits like your local morning radio show. Also, the Web Comic Beacon Newscast recaps, reviews, and discussions of community and industry news relative to comic creators, especially of digital distribution. Also, the Tropecast, the ever tangential discussion of literary and visual memes. And finally, Web Fiction World. Before web comics, there was independent and self published web release written fiction and literature. Find this all at webcastbeacon.com. Be sure to grab a master RSS feed or master iTunes feed and not miss a thing. Drunk Duck News. If the news is foul, you'll hear it here first. <laughs> Hey everybody, this is Black Kitty. And this is Fang. And we're here once again with your weekly dose <coughs> of Drunk Duck... Fashionably late dose of Drunk Duck News. Attention, webcomic authors. The cross over the word is threatening the webcomic multiverse. <coughs> Sorry, I must be catching a cold. The powers that be are calling out for heroes. The authors of Cross Over the Word are looking for webcomic hero cameos to appear in the newly launched Cross Overlord webcomic series. Your hero may be any kind of genre, and it must be an original character. Submissions should be given to the Cross Overlord forum at Drunk Duck, or visit drunkduck.com slash crossoverlord for details. Cross Overlord launched April 15th and features the heroic team of Macagical Girl Lisa Ant, Dead Debbie from the webcomic Indefensible Positions, Lightbringer, Mind Mistress, and Drunk Duck's own Dacian. But if you're really going to do crossover with webcomics, a lot of the webcomics, it really wouldn't work that well to have them all operating out of the same reality. There, there's so much out there, you know, right. and that's when the strength of webcomics are like manga as opposed to American comics. There are a lot of different genres out there. Uh, you know, things like Girl Genius, okay? That would be hard to cross over in a traditional uh, superhero comic or, you know, the more <laughs> comedic things like Valkyrie Yucky. But, you know, this we can cross over, you know, at a, and, you know, to say, you know, they're all separate realities. So actually it kind of works well for us. Um, Valkyrie Yucky. I thought it was Yuki. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure how to pronounce it. I'm pretty sure it's Yuki because y- okay, y- Yuki sounds bad. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> we're gonna have we're gonna have a swarm uh, of of sparkling generation Valkyrie fans just descending upon Crossover Lord now to say it's not Yuki. Your comics, Yuki. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, there go the pages. Uh, the page hits for a while anyway. Um... <laughs> Send your hate mail to the <laughs> <laughs> That's Don't right. Blame, blame me, you know. So, uh, direct the angry thing to my mistress. That's it's my mispronunciation, no one else's. <laughs> oh, I, I mean, I can make other pronun- mispronunciations like dice, dice. What? Don't you dare! <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think my mistress always calls her Daisy Ann? Uh, yes. Uh, coming off of the last thing of uh, the listeners just heard of. Uh, uh, Al was talking about calling to see in Daisy Ann, and the first question we got here just happens to be about Mind Mistress and Decian. Tony Canada says, uh, "Will Mind Mistress and Decian ever have another crossover? Their relationship was very fun to witness." Um, there, there's something that I'm kind of working on by myself. There, uh, some pages have been drawn. Um, might not put color to it, but uh, I do plan on having like a. Uh, farewell to Mind Mistress, because uh, I understand the Mind Mistress is coming to an end, or may have already come to an end. Has that happened, Al? Yeah, I, I, I pretty much. I, I didn't have it actually, but I, I got through about ten. I, I literally done ten years of Mind Mistress, and I suddenly got realized I've done ten years of Mind Mistress, <laughs> and it kind of been, went. Mm-hmm. You know, I did thirty storylines, and the storyline I was doing was kind of. You know, it was going to take forever to finish, and I kind of went, eh, that's enough. 
<laughs> but uh, I am reprinting uh, the old My Mistress on uh, uh, Drunk Duck, you know, so there'll be a separate place with them stored. And uh, I am working on two other different comics. You know, I just want to get through cross the, the successor to Crossover Lord, which is about to wind up before yeah. I start publishing those. Yeah, Crossover Kill, which is another uh, wonderful crossover and much more uh, cohesive and coherent than what Crossover Lord was. <laughs> because uh, <laughs> because uh, you guys knew what the ending was going to be from the very beginning. In fact, you start with the ending. Yeah, and I have to just say that Al... Yeah. Mind Mistress really was one of the greatest, oh my god, wow, web comics I've seen. And it in one of the biggest draws that got me into Crossover Lord and Crossover Kill was just the chance to work with you. Okay, great. Glad to hear. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 was, it was pretty fun to do. Yeah, I'll second that. Okay. Pablo Prano asks, did the event of did the events in Crossover Lord play out in the regular individual web comics? Um, not not mine, obviously, because mine is still um, in the past, and Crossover Lord hasn't happened yet. Uh, Guardian uh, already finished when I when I got to it, and uh, yeah. so yeah, there are there are going to be some connecting points, but I'm not going to spoil it too much. Uh, I was just finishing up the last pages of Decian and Energize today, and uh, there won't really be a connecting point, but there will be something at the end. You're actually going to finish up the thing with Energize? Yeah, we are. <laughs> and I, I was I lost the script for so long, and I was kind of burned out and busy like all this time, and I really didn't know what we were going to do with it. And I found the script. I'm like, I better finish this. So <laughs> there, there's going to be kind of a spiritual connection between the ending of Crossover Kill. Uh, there's something at the end of Crossover Kill. I'm not going to say what it is, but it's going to hook into energized to see it in some way um more 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 thematically than plot wise but you'll see what i mean when it happens um let's see oh lp hogan from the cameo and crossover archive says uh i've got to admit uh to me enjoying the antics of lisa uh also with me being a bit of a bias uh Oh yeah, he's saying that he has a bias for Lisa, but he says that the scene comes in a close second. I had asked on uh, on DeviantArt who was your favorite hero, and he was the only one who responded to me. So he says Ant. Yeah, Ant was a lot of fun to write for, just because she mm-hmm. was the anime manga type character. And you got to watch Nuku Nuku again. Yeah, I got to watch Nuku Nuku again, and she's <laughs> Ant is kind of like an archetype character that uh, is also kind of like another character that I in a comic I just put up on. Uh, on uh, DeviantArt about a month ago, uh, I did a Parker Lynn Bailey comic, and there's a character called Palady who uh, might have the L and R swapped in her name for some reason, and she kind of acts like Ant. So that that's kind of an archetype that I was already working with. So that's, awesome. Yeah. Um. Let's see. Pablo asks, what were the crossovers before it? Oh, we we kind of answered this. Uh, the crossovers, the crossover wars. Uh, came before it, and after it, there was Crossover Kill. Um, there was also Energized to see. And w- were there any other crossovers that you guys were involved in? Um, Ultra did show up as a guest page on Flicker Flame. That's right. Yeah. Which was tied into the Crossover Lord. Exactly, yes. Right. I remember that because uh, because Al loves uh, references, and I said Robert Redford. <laughs> <laughs> I think I yeah, said uh... I think I said Robert. I thought my drawing was stronger if I have a particular person in mind for the various uh, characters. So should I mention who I base a lot of them on? Sure. Okay. Uh, Lightbringer was actually uh, young Peter O'Toole in, uh, you know, say Lawrence of Arabia. Okay. Um, My mistress was uh, Lip Taylor, Tyler, of course. Um, and, you know, whether she was Lorelei or, you know, either way, you know, it was the same bone structure, same face structure, that sort of thing. Um, actually, Abby, who I used for um, the Green Avenger, I used a very young, um, very famous fa- famous singer, and she did a lot of uh, Willie Screwball movies, too. Barbara um, Streisand? Yes. Oh, young Barbara yeah. Streisand. But to a certain extent, you know, uh, 
And one of the things I like the Green Avenger is she look uh, makes sense. Is she is you, but she looks like a real person. Okay. Yeah. She, I, I've always thought of her as sort of the Peter Parker of female superheroes. Okay. Mm-hmm. She, she, she was the female superhero that you could identify with rather than being an idolization like Wonder Woman. Okay. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but, you know, I was trying to look, you know, brownish hair, you know, and Barbara Streisand. So I, I, the very young Barbara no, Streisand, you know, like what's up, Doc? I always try to give her a normal kind of, you know, biggish nose because uh-huh. I have a big nose. <laughs> <laughs> so, and Barbara Streisand is a good model for that. Right. Uh, let's see now. Um, uh, for Neil, I think I use I I actually used the wrong reference. He he picked one blonde uh, uh, actress, and I misunderstood the name and picked and, and did another one. But uh, I do remember it was all that. Good, yeah, yeah. Huh? So the one I usually base her on is uh, Charlize Theron. Right. Yeah. And I picked someone very close to that, but not quite her. You know, and, and but I used her in most Probably of Cameron the. Diaz. Yeah, it was, Ca- it was Cameron Diaz. You know, that's right. <laughs> But that's okay. It's uh, that's great though. It's uh, it's great to know which which uh, actors look like our heroes. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I, I've forgotten uh, who I did for Ant, but you know, it, it was just you know like a, a young sixteen year old uh, actress. Uh, I, I've re- I've forgotten her name. She was in Willy Wonka. Um, I mean, Charlie in the Chocolate Factory, not Willy Wonka. Oh, the Chocolate good one. Factory. Yeah, the one that uh, Tim Burton did. Uh, but I used her, you know, to sort of model 16-year-old girl's movements. So ah. It worked for me. And uh, smiling now, who that? Malcolm McDowell? Uh, I think that's who it was. No, but it'll come to me. You know, you're close. It was something like that. Hmm. Anyway, but it was, that, that's basically a lot of... A lot of the character references I use, uh, and it did make the characters a little bit more solid for me. Excellent. Excellent. So, we ready to move on to the next question? Yes, we are. Okay. Nero Angelo, a, re- a reader on Drunk Duck, asks, what did you like about each other, each superhero and about working with each of the other comic creators? Um, I kind of answered this question already. I will say that I, I did like the uh, the 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 pot of ideas that we just kept throwing in, in all these ideas into, and we just mix it all up. And what you got was like a little piece of each of us. And, uh, it was, it was a much, I thought it was a, I thought it was a pretty good, uh, a mix. What, what we got out of it. I know we kind of changed directions a few times and there's a couple plot threads that don't seem to go anywhere, but in the end, uh, crossover Lord ended up being something I'm very proud of. And it, it, it's nice to have a story that I actually, uh, ended <laughs> Yeah, and uh, and, and you know, I, I think I sort of answered this question earlier when the, I just heaped a huge load of praise on the Al. <laughs> but uh, but Neil, I I love working with Neil too because uh, because Neil's known by his slogan, "I draw cartoon chicks." Well, yeah. <laughs> and Remus, and Remus has that uh, that sharp wit as always, and and Abby, I mean Abby, uh, remind me Abby, did we actually meet in person once? Maybe. Yes, yes, at uh, at the um, comic, comic cookout Genesis barbecue, like a bunch of years ago. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, Which... we met there. I remember that. Um, and Lee Carr was there too, and so were a bunch of other people. But I remember meeting you there. Yeah, I'm cool. We're cool. We're bros. <laughs> yeah, was that was that the one where where we went to the space? Not the space needle. Where we went to the went to the uh, gateway arc. Yeah, I didn't go though. I stayed at home because I was like, I'm gonna sleep forever. I'm on vacation. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> that that was that was fun. We we it was, it was insane. Time. The, the the I I hung out by the pool instead. <laughs> but that was that was great. We we all got a group together. We went to the Gateway Arc and uh, and other things too. But uh, I think that was the one where we did the eating contest. Ah, uh, yes. Oh uh, God. Yeah. That pizza, <laughs> that disgusting pizza. If for for those of you who don't know, uh, there in in St. Louis there is this place called Pointer's T- Pizza that has this massive pizza called the Pointer Source. If you finish it, you get you win fifty bucks. Oh, 
but, but you have to sign these medical waivers, and there's all sorts of rules saying you can't use napkins to sop up the pizza juice. And there's, oh. like, this huge pool of grease right in the middle of this pizza. Oh. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> but, yeah, it, it, I, I love working with all, all you guys. It was It was really a blast. Yeah, it, it was a much richer thing for all the ideas everybody was throwing at each other. Um, then I would have come up separately, or, or you know, Neil would have, or any of us really. And we certainly, uh, as, as we said before, we hijacked Link Era's short little outline that he thought would only run 30 pages, and you know made this massive epic out of it. <laughs> well, all the characters or were meandering this. mess, whichever way you want to look at it. But uh, well, well, the way I know. see it, the way I see it is, is it's like a gestalt. It's it's like you know, you you, you take you take the constructor cons and devastators like, more than just devastator. Oh God! Yes, I'm a nerd. <laughs> and I like some of the characters we introduced. I, I really actually li- really like the three keepers of the armory. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We didn't talk Huey, about Dewey that. and Louie. Yeah. Yes. Well, one of my favorite stories Neil told me was the robots, and uh, Neil was telling me about the uh, the feet of the robots. Oh, those those hideous robots that I designed. Um, <laughs> yeah, I had designed these these green and tan robots, and I had done them very quickly, very fast, and I, I look at them now and I just cringe. But yeah, the feet were supposed to be like Valkyrie feet, the front the Valkyries from Macross, because I love Macross, and I think. All but one other person understood what I was talking about. Like, like everyone else just drew them with like flat duck feet. And I was mm-hmm. okay. Well, the creator of interpretation. So I, I never made a fuss about it. But they were ugly robots anyway. So I was <laughs> glad when they were out of the story entirely and replaced with red robots. Yay! Well, I should have used all along. I don't know why I didn't think of that earlier. Of course, by the time Crossover Lord came around, no one even remembered what red robot was. Well, you could have had Domo Domos. True. Although, if you still read Diesel Sweeties, you, I think Red Robot appears in that quite often, the webcomic written Diesel Sweeties. But what Red Robot was, is he was like the original cameo character, even before Jenny Everywhere. He was, uh, he would make all sorts of cameos. I think he was originally on uh, ExplodingDog.com. Oh, God, no. Yeah. So, that's, that's what Red Robot is. And, um, yeah, what... What other goofy stories can we throw in here at the end? Um, uh, um, pretty much. There, there was a time that we decided to uh, do a uh, Order of the Stick version of all the characters. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> By throwing them into a two-dimensional universe and drawing them exactly the way the characters would look if they appeared in Order of the Stick. I, I, I never I, got a chance to get an official crossover with the Order of the Stick guy i sent him several emails and never got an answer back so but there there were several other rip-offs so i could do that without you know saying you know they were definitely in order of the sticks world but we all knew that's probably where they were okay now we did get permission to do a girl genius crossover what the member in the armory the folk yeah. gave us permission to do that i thought you knew about that man if if I knew we could have gotten the Foglios in on something, I would. Oh my god! Uh, it was a one-page thing. And uh, they were very right, yeah, right. I wrote them, and they, I got permission to mention uh, a, a one-page uh, appearance of the uh, Mechanics Bird, uh, okay. where uh, Girl Genius is set. But I, I didn't get you know Girl Ge- you know it's it just one sort of a one-page you know homage. Well, well, sorry. It's just I'm just you know Phil Foglio just. My one of my oh my god, Phil Foglio moments. Especially lately, have you been reading it lately? I mean, his art has, you know, it's right up there with uh, Dresden Kodak as far as art is concerned for a web comic. You know, what, what you can do with the medium. I just love how he draws women. Well, uh-huh. see, and I thought I was the per. Well, it's more than that. He draws powerful women. That's true. It's practice. He's been drawing women. Around what, 20 years? More? More. 30 years. True, true. But uh, anyways, I think we're, we're, we're just sort of gone off the rails here, but let's get yeah. back on the train. Yeah, uh, the, the armory was fun just because we had all these signs every which way in the armory. It was like, 
this way to the history eraser button, that way to uh, Narpa Sword. And, mm-hmm. Yeah, a- anytime there was a video game reference, it was usually me. But <laughs> what, what other? What usually, other... I had to have it explained because I didn't grow up on video games like most of you guys. Okay, <laughs> so you know, Neil would have to explain all these manga and uh, video game references. Because sorry, you know, I mean, uh, what little I know, I learned from what my you know my son's playing them. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Like like I said, it's uh, I, I was I was happy because when I did my one did my the last page of my six page uh, side story because I knew for sure oh Al will get this joke with, with parasite I knew I knew yeah. It. yeah there were jokes for everyone so it was uh I'm it, I, yeah the, oh yeah he was in there Dave was in there <laughs> <laughs> Neil you have to explain on Dave now okay Dave is uh. I, I kind of have this argument that I have on, on the lo- online every now and then where people are like, well, you can't really define a character without a good star- uh, character arc. And I've always been, I, I believe that character arcs are important, but I've always been a character writer. So I just, I think you can make a character without, you know, having to go through this massive series of events to describe the character. So I just or had a character. Texting. Yeah, I just had a character who was just one line is all he said and. All he says is, I'm Dave. And he, he pops in when you least expect him. And sure enough, he showed up when we had to get rid of Goldie. So, What's going on? Who are you? I'm Dave. <laughs> yeah. Oh, one thing we should mention, you know, the, the uh, constant, you know, how it became almost a gang about the name. Okay. Like originally, um, like Remus mentioned, it was. Crisis on Infinite Web Comics or whatever, and you know nobody really wanted that. That was just like a working thing. But we tried to think of a name, and I especially tried to think of a name because it bugged me that we didn't have a name. And one of the names I came up was Cross Over Lords for the group, you know, and sort of the same idea of Masters of the Universe. Okay, you know, it's and the others rightfully said no, that's that's it makes them sound like bad guys, and. We sort of thought about for for a couple of emails back and forth, and then we said, "Yeah, just the crossover lord would make a great name for, you know, who they're fighting, and we could name it after him, sort of like Lord of the Rings. You know, is Lord of the Rings refers to song. So, uh, but I would keep on coming up with the cheesiest, awfulest names, and and Neil would, would very nicely deflate every one of them. Okay." You're still so, doing it. Yeah, right. And so we, uh, um, when we re-ran it on uh, Web Comics Nation, I would have the three, like, we'd have heads with the characters um, saying different names for the group, okay? You know, crossover alert versus, you know, and all these stupid, cheesy names that oh, come yeah. up. The Dewey Good yeah, figures and, and stuff like that. Yeah, I remember that. We had fun with that. Yeah, Ben Ben's got a whole collection of those that I sent him, so he'll probably be dropping a bunch of those right now. Oh yeah, <laughs> I, I'm surprised Neil. Again, no three no WA reference. Yeah, uh, I yeah I did a a, a ridiculous wrestling uh, angle in in the middle of the comic, and I, and we had this, and not once did I ever reference the Dirty Pair, and I I don't know <laughs> I must have been sick that day. Or, <laughs> um, <laughs> you thought it was too obvious. Yeah, that that's it. I'll I'll retcon my myself and say that's what it was. Okay. Well, uh, speaking of the 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 name the crossover lord, uh, uh, the Spider Man almost got a rename. Oh uh, well, we tried. Um, we, well, we tried with the crossover lord in general, just to say, hey, this is the character's name. Uh, but it it nothing ever replaced the Smiling Man. I think one of my suggestions was uh like the Technomancer or something like that. And I slipped and called him that in one of the commentaries, actually. So that that's actually on the Drunk Duck version somewhere. But, uh, oh. yeah, for some reason, we, we never came up with a different name for him. And I, I think it's just because he was established for so long that there was no... It's kind of silly to come but, up with I mean, him. he was in one story arc with Lightbringer, you know, and that's what they called him to. Yeah. The biggest problem I had with Smiling Man is his appearance was so... You know, he he really didn't, you know, I mean, he had a bowler hat like Mr. Mixie Plicks. He had a smile like the Joker or the Green Goblin. But otherwise, I mean, he dressed very... He wore a button shirt and khakis. Mm -hmm. Fine. 
you know, it's it, it was kind of like he he wasn't really set. And, and I know a couple of times we proposed, and I think Ben pre- referred to this earlier uh, in some of the things Neil sent him. You know, we tried different drawings of him, you know, and maybe make him more imposing. But at the end, we kind of went, eh. Well, you know, I mean, it is Link Era's character, and Link Era came up with the original idea. Maybe we can work with this. And actually, it in some ways it actually did work. Uh, maybe it's sort of like the Red Skull. You know, the Red Skull has the Red Skull, but the rest of the thing is a very, you know, it's just a jumpsuit basically. Yeah, and so, actually, I got to point out one thing that's interesting to me is one of the most sinister pages for Smiling Man was done by Remus. Yes. Yeah. Where basically the smiling man has altered the stars to create a giant smiley face in the sky. And it was what's her name, Pink something. She says, But what about habitable planets? And he just is smiling and says, Hey, hey, oops. <laughs> right. You know, I, I think what really triggered Smiling Man for me was when I came up with a reason for his costume. Yes. Because it, it was yes. the funeral clothes for his ex wife. And right. that just made him much, much creepier. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I see. And at the end, we did give, give him a lot more personality than, uh, and you know, of course, Link Era contributed to it, but a lot more than he showed in his original story arc. Yeah. So, who who designed the the wife character? Because I I don't think she had a design coming in. Uh, I think the idea behind her was mostly Link Era. Huh. I don't. Yeah, and I, I, didn't, I, I draw that, didn't I draw the first page she appeared on? But yeah, I, I'm not that's sure. what I was, I was thinking. I was pretty sure that that Al drew the first page that she showed up in. Because that was the same page where everyone was uh, was doing like Mystery Science Theater 3000 and eating popcorn yeah. and that's, making yeah. comments, you know, while watching it, you know, which again I thought, and I don't know who suggested that, but it was a wonderful suggestion, you know, it was a good way for them to interact while still. Unfolding I, the story. That, that was Neil again, the <laughs> eating popcorn. It was yeah, the, Neil is a it, Neil is the missed fanboy here, uh-huh. mystery K fanboy here. I, but the, I haven't seen. Well, it's been a while since I've seen the show, but yeah, I I love that show. <laughs> okay, but uh, it, it, so I think uh, I think we're pretty much storied out. We have any other questions, Neil? Um, just one last thing from Pablo. What's what's left for us after the comic? Um, well, the scene is coming back. Eventually, I have been drawing pages again. Ben seen some of them. I've been posting them on Facebook. Yeah, the scene's coming back. Um, I can't really say no, no spoilers just yet, but I I do have some uh, some good ideas for the storyline that's coming up. I'm actually I've actually got the end of the current story arc that I've been working on forever. Yay! Uh, yeah, the last page uh, is drawn out, is sketched out at least, and. Uh, that's that's what's that's what's going on for me at the moment. Uh, I got a couple other goofy ideas that I've been sharing with Kitty Hawk, so I'm not gonna really reveal them just yet. But uh. Uh, well, let's see. Now I'm working on two. Uh, one's called the Skill Set, which is actually about two superhero teams. One that that's called the Power Players, who are basically, you know, their their universe is Justice League and Avengers. But there's another group that's sort of playing against them. And uh, it's sort of an updated version of the old Seven Soldiers of Victory, which if you actually read the stories, you realize none of these guys had powers, except maybe Shining Knight, but, you know, he, he just had magical equipment. But not, all the rest of them were basically Batman type. Actually, Shining Knight, Shining Knight had some superhuman strength. He was able to wrestle with a troll. Hmm. Well, it must have been a weak troll, because he, otherwise he's not supposed to have any powers, okay? And that's one of the things that's... And I kind of looked at that and thought about a Silver Age version, you know, which at the time, this was before Mr. Miracle joined the Justice League, but I was going, you know, we could have a team with Mr. Miracle and Batgirl and stuff. Well, uh, basically, it was, it was sort of the same idea. One group will be the Superman of Super Teams, but the other one will be the Batman. And as you guys know... In the long run, Batman might be considered more fascinating in some ways. Okay, you know, but, but one's going to be more the more skilled uh, group and ha- tackle the one. One team will be doing you know the multi-dimensional universe-shattering thing, but the other one will be actually tackling crime cartels and doing some good. 
And there's another one I'm working on, really hard to describe. Uh, I do have an idea for a third crossover, but I'm not, it's called Crossover Power, but uh, I don't know if I, I'm ever going to get to that. We'll see. I need to get a finished Crossover Kill before I get to that, if I do that. Right. But at the end of Crossover Lord, I mentioned the Doppelganger Gang, which is the main bad guys in Crossover Kill. I also mentioned another group called the Tour de Force, and that's who I imagine for uh, crossover power. Hmm. Interesting. You know, I've always thought if there was ever a prequel to Crossover Lord and Crossover Kill, it should be called Crossover Chur. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a good way to end this. <laughs> really? <laughs> Along so, the same lines, I've been working, well, on and off, on a one-page humor on crossover pass. It's going to put oh. all our heroes in the Wacky Racers cards. Oh! I <laughs> love that. Uh-huh. I love it. Yep. Okay. And uh, so, any other final notes, guys? Um, can I mention, can I mention what I'm doing now? Yes. I got Genocide Man uh, going on. It's a hilarious look at mass murder. And uh, I'm going to be publishing the first of, I think, three books either at the end of this year or to start of next. Hmm. And we actually, we actually mentioned Genocide Man briefly in the crossover, Lord. Uh, yes, you did. Yeah, we did. Yes. Hmm. Is that everything? Uh, I'm still doing translation. That's about it. <laughs> As for me, <laughs> where, where are you translating? What languages are you translating from? Japanese. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm translating manga uh, for a site called jmanga.com. Um, I mean, I'm not doing it right now because uh, they have a big backlog of stuff that I've done for them, and they don't have any budget money until April, so it's a wait. But um, the the two projects that I did for them are um, the myth, mythical detective Loki and um, and Pipira Note, which is a which is about having budgies. <laughs> it's, like a, it's a four panel comic about budgies. It's really cute. Um, that's it. Okay. As for me, I was working on Hero Academy and I was going to do a new Majestic Night thing. Uh, but uh, last year, uh, one of the people that was working with me on Hero Academy, uh, one of my friends and artist, Asaku, he tragically passed away last year. And it was really hard and it's still hard to work out the creative kinks after that it's uh yeah he was he was one of my best friends and artists and he did lots of guest pages for uh crossover kill that's right yeah. every time yeah, someone some of the best ones yeah yeah and uh it was it was just devastating for me it really he, was and he was a good guy we had him on was. the show a lot of times yeah, yeah. and the, i loved him like a brother and it, it's just sad to have him gone but uh Right now, I'm just trying to get into back into the writing phase and probably drawing again. And and uh, in fact, I was trying to draw an image of all of all of our heroes, like a behind the actors' studio kind of image, and I never got it together quite right. But I was trying. Okay, that's that's all I got right now. But Neil and I were currently, you know, we you know, other than doing comics, and Neil and I are currently doing a podcast, Animation Aficionados. I think everyone's heard of it by now. Yeah. Which is why I sound a lot more coherent now than I did on the episodes of Webcomic Beacon, because now I know how to talk. <laughs> Practice makes perfect. Yes. So, yes. Uh, now that we're wrapping up, uh, some some thank yous do have to be said here. Uh, uh, Fess, I'd like to thank Fess for supplying the audio from Webcomic Beacon, episode 80, oh, yeah. uh, 68. Uh, you can check that out at webcastbeacon.com. Also, like to thank JT Shea for that uh for that uh, audio clip that we got from the gig cast. He's now doing uh, drawing the wrong conclusions on nightgig.com. Uh, LP Hogan for the comic cameo and crossover archive without which I would still be looking for images. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, the artists who are not here, Dan McGee, Lewis Lovehog, Corey Bellotti, Alan from Due East, Omega justice and Algaya. Uh, all those people contributed to crossover Lord. Thank you guys. That's about it. Uh, thank you for listening. Glad everybody enjoyed the experience. I know Thanks. I did. Thanks for everything, everybody. Honor working with you all, folks. All right. All right. Yeah. And that's our show. See you later. See you Bye. later.
All right. Thanks, Al.